One of the most important skills to master when becoming an ANP is the understanding of measurement systems. After all, would you fly in an airplane where a door doesn't close or the panels aren't quite lined up? Now there's two commonly used systems of measuring, conventional and metric. The conventional system, otherwise known as US Imperial English measurements, they consist of inches, gallons, pounds, that kind of thing. Now if you're from the US, you're probably most familiar with using these, let's say, unique measurements. Most other countries around the world use the metric system. This consists of units such as meters, liters, and grams. Now the metric system is so easy because each subdivision goes up or down by a power of 10. And here we have a chart that shows us the different prefix for the metric system. What's really cool is that regardless of if you're using meters, liters, or any other kind of metric measurement, these prefixes all stay the same. So if you have 1,000 of something, it will start with kilo, kilometers, kilograms, etc. Now when we move the decimal place back and forth like we see here, we change that prefix, and that's using the decimal system. And the way we do this in the imperial system is with fractions, which we'll talk about a little later. Now I know we all have very advanced computers right in the palm of our hand these days, and those can convert almost anything into anything else. But the FAA still expects you to know how to do those conversions on your own. So let's you and I take a look at some questions you might have to answer on your test. To start, let's say you need to convert inches to millimeters. Well, to do that, just multiply the number of inches by 25.4 because there's 25.4 millimeters in one inch. For example, 20 inches times 25.4 is 508 millimeters. Now next, to convert ounces to grams, you just multiply the number of ounces by 28.35. For example, if we need to find out how many grams is in 12 ounces, we would multiply 12 by 28.35 to get about 340.2 grams. Now the FAA also expects you to know how to convert numbers into something called scientific notation. Now you can think of scientific notation as a type of shorthand to express very large or very small numbers. Now let's take a look at this number right here. It's so big, I don't even know how to say it. Now to convert this massive number into scientific notation, you just move the decimal point to be between the first and the second digits. In this case, the one and the two right here. And count how many places it took in order to move it there. So this number represented in scientific notation as 1.244, and since the decimal point was moved 12 places to the left to get there, it'll be 1.244 times 10 to the power of 12. Now converting the other way is just as easy. So let's give it a try with this example right here. 3.68 times 10 to the seventh power. Now to convert it back to standard notation, we just move the decimal back to the right. And to figure out how many places you move the decimal point, just look, right here. Our number is 3.68 times 10 to the seventh power. So we just move the decimal point to the right seven places, making it 36,800,000 in standard notation. And this is just as easy, by the way, if you have a negative sign in front of the power. Instead of moving the decimal point to the right, we simply move the decimal point to the left. And that gives us this really small number in standard notation. You see, nothing to it. Now you might also encounter questions about fractions and decimals on the knowledge test. More specifically, how to convert between fractions and decimals. Now you might remember that a fraction is a number written in the form seen here, where you have a number on top called the numerator and one on the bottom called the denominator. And this bar here is the fraction bar, which shows you division is taking place. 
So to convert a fraction into a decimal, you simply divide the top number by the bottom number. In this example, you would divide 3 by 5 in order to get 0.6. All right, that wasn't so bad. Now let's try going the other way around and convert a decimal into a fraction. Now to do that, start by taking the numbers to the right of the decimal point, 25 in this example, and make them your numerator. Next, add 100 as the denominator below that. Now that sure looks like a fraction. Now you might be thinking, that's all there is to it. But we can simplify this fraction. And to do that, we just need to find the highest number that both the numerator and the denominator can be divided by. As long as you can divide both by the same number, it will not change the value of the fraction. In this case, both can be divided by 25. So just divide 25 by 25 and 100 by 25, and that will give you 1 over 4 or 1 quarter. Now just put that together with the number we had to the left of the decimal point, which was 4, and that gives us a fraction of 4 and 1 quarter. So what do you say we try a harder one? What would 0.52 be shown as a fraction? Well, again, start with the numbers to the right of the decimal point and put that number 52 over 100. Now, in this case, we can't divide both numbers by the numerator, 52. So we have to find the next highest number that we can divide both numbers by. Well, just by inspection, I can see that both of these numbers can be divided by 4. And when you do that, you get 13 over 25. At this point, it's as simple as you can get, since no further single number could be divided equally into both of these. Now, since the number to the left of the decimal point was 0, we have our simplified fraction of 13 25ths. Piece of cake. Now, depending on how much precision you're working with, you might find a time where it makes sense to round a number to a more practical one. And this handy chart right here tells us what each place left and right of the decimal point means. Now, in this chart, the decimal point would be right here. And to the right of the decimal point, we first have tens followed by hundredths, thousandths, and ten thousandths. And to the left, we have ones, we have tens, hundredths, and so on. So, we'll use this to help us know what we're rounding. Now, let's say you measured 29.3456 inches with a very precise laser ruler, and you needed to round that into something more useful. Well, in our example, we want to round to the hundredths place. And using this chart, we know that the hundredths place is the 4 right here. So we'll look at the next number to the right of that. And since that number is 5 or greater, we can round up the 4 by 1 to a 5. And we get a final rounded number of 29.35. Now the last number system that we need to talk about is binary notation. And that's the language of our friend, the computer. Now binary only has two digits, zeros and ones, and the information is stored as those zeros and ones. It's kind of like an on-off switch, which forms strings of binary numbers that can be translated into something more useful. So how do we go about translating these strings of zeros and ones? Well, to do that, we first need to look at this figure right here and it shows the place value each number has in a binary string. And to convert that into a decimal, you just have to add up all the place values where you have a 1. So if our number was just 1 in binary, that would equal 1 in decimal. Easy. Now if we had 1, 1, 1, we'd look at all three of these place values and add up 4, 2, and 1, giving us a value of 7. You see, all we have to do is use the chart here to make this process pretty easy. So let's try converting the binary string 
10110011 into a decimal using this figure. Now remember, we only add a value where there's a 1 and we do nothing with the zeros. So we have a 1 in the 128 column, the 32 column, the 16 column, the 2 column, and the 1 column. Add all those values up and we get a value of 179. Now you also might be asked on the knowledge test to convert a decimal number like 233 to binary. And to do that, we'll start with our number 233. Then we'll look at our chart here for the biggest number that we can subtract from it. In our case, it's this 128 right here. So we'll mark a 1 in this column first. Now 233 minus 128 results in 105 left over. So what's the next biggest number we can subtract from 105? Well, it looks like it's this 64 value right here. So we'll put another 1 in that column, and 105 minus 64 gives us 41. Now again, we'll look at the next biggest number that goes into 41, and that would be 32 right here in the next column. Now add another 1 here, and then subtract 32 from 41, just like we've been doing. And that leaves us with 9 left over, which can then go into this column right here, where we'll mark a 1 and subtract 8. Now that leaves us with just 1 left over. So we go into this final column and mark a 1 down. Now you just go back and put a 0 in any column that's left over. And that gives us our final binary number for 233, which is 11101001. So there you have it, folks, a rundown of the main measurement systems we use with a basic understanding of numbering systems and how to convert between them. You'll have no problem dealing with the many ways that sizes may be expressed to you as an A and P.